Hi. Hello. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about automation of the Linux, Linux network performance testing, but not from a kernel perspective, more like a, from a network engineering perspective. But first, let me try to introduce myself. I'm working in, as a team lead in the OpenStack cloud team uh, during the day. And I'm working during the night as a developer in Kubernetes in the project Kind. And right now, I'm heavily working on graduating IPVC support in Kubernetes to bed. But let me try to, to bring a bit of history on why, why I'm talking about network performance testing. I was a network engineer during 12 years. Network engineer as in telcos with big deployments, big data centers. Um, in 2015, a company in Barcelona started to create a project to create an SDN. At the time, the SDN, they tried to to abstract the network so it was easily to consume for the customers. And the goal was to create a logical topology with virtual devices that run on top of hardware, bare metal routers, allowing to aggregate whatever you want, VMs, containers. Uh, for that, they use it PGP, they use it OpenB switch, they use it pump of uh, tools, but they have a big problem that when they went to production environments, everything started to fall down and they couldn't understand what was the problem. So they decided to hire a person with experience in, in real networks and that was my goal, to try to bring this experience to the company, to the developer there that were creating this SDN, these uh, products and they were uh, struggling on why the performance on their testing was okay, but it wasn't performing on the deployment of the customers. So to try to set the scene and, and having a common understanding, first is, this is how a developer, well, this I'm generalizing, but bear with me. So the thing is, that's, how the developer, the developer see the network. He just create an application, open a socket, and the kernel is doing all the cancellations, so at the end the packet goes through the network and magically it appears in the other side where other application is listening in another socket and is replying back. We can see the most typical example is we do a get to a to a web server and it just returns the content. So far so good, this is how the network is for a network engineer. So when, when the developers see that, what the network engineer like me saw at that time is, I only thinking in how is the wireless of the guy in, in their office or in whatever place, is the Islam working, how, what service providers are the packet traveling, is my firewall, my load balancers okay? How are the servers in, in the data center? And this was back in previous, all the virtualization era, when everybody has only uh, servers, it was quite easy because you know what you have and where it was. So everything was st static, so it was hard to do change dynamically, but it was easy to maintain. Then, uh, I don't know, in 2000s is when all VMware, Shen, all these projects started to, KVM, QM, we started to create the VMs, and the people realized that they were spending a lot of money in servers, they most of the time were idle, so they started to put in on VMs. But well, those VMs need to be reachable from the internet. So they started with simple breaches, they started to create loops, I don't know how many uh, layer two loops I solved in the 2000s because somebody started to plug VMs into the network. And something was needed. So this, this created this uh, Martin Casao 
created this uh, open flow concept. Uh, he started this uh, STM startup called Nisida that later was acquired by VMware. And they started with the STM hype. So the promise was that you don't have to care again about the network. We are going to extract everything and the, pa the packets are going to go magically from one side to the other. And well, this added a new complexity to the networking side. Later on, it's even more difficult because inside those VMs, we have containers. Those containers have more virtual, more uh, devices, more virtual router, more virtual switches. You can imagine. From the network engineer point of view, that's, you even don't know where is the packet. You don't know if it's in the overlay, in the underlay, if it's, it's a nightmare. So, the, how do you test the performance there? But first, let's try to agree on what performance is. So I don't like to go into the semantics, so I found this, this description that, for me, is the, the, the best one that matches what performance means. Is the word performance in computer performance means the same thing that performance means in other contexts. That is, it means how well is the computer doing the work that it's supposed to do. And back in those times when we don't have the ends containers, we can say that we have computer resistant performance and we have network performance. For the system performance, I'm not gonna pretend that I know what it, this is, <laughs> but <laughs> for system performance, you have methodologies. You know how to measure the utilization. If the thing that you are measuring is saturated, you can check the errors. You Basically, you are able to profile everything. So you know what load you need to put to saturate something and start to find the bottleneck. And for networking performance, it was easy because at that time, you have one de device for firewalling, one, one device for routing, one device for uh, load balancing. And the architecture were, was pretty simple. You have a management plane where you configure everything. You have a control plane that talks with other routers that install the routers, does all the logic and to program the data plane that he only has to forward packets. And for networking performance in that time, we have clear metrics. If you are with a router, you need to know the throughput, the latency, the packets per second that is able to forward. Uh, actually, there is an RPC, I don't know, 20 years old or more, that is describing all these things. If you have a firewall, you have a load balancer, you have another metrics, you need to know how many connections per seconds, but everything was so simple. You have a device and you know how to profile that device. So what happens with all this evolution that people started to put Linux everywhere? And then you have to put Linux as a router, Linux as a load balancer. But Linux is, uh, Linux is using the CPU to, to do the forwarding plan, and I'm simplifying because I know Marco is going to talk later about this, and there are other technologies that are solving this problem, but when we are reaching 10 gigabits per second, these are the times that the CPU need to, these are the times that the CPU has to process something. So if you are with the minimum size of, of bytes, you practically cannot go to, to memory to read something. And that's why it's hard for l the Linux kernel to be a, a router. And I don't think that's the goal of the Linux kernel to be a router. There are projects uh, that Marco is going to talk later that are achieving this, but that's to understand why, why you cannot have the same performance as a router with the minimum setup. Okay, so once that we move one layer above, so we just see how Linux as a router for guarding IP packets only can behave with 10 gigas, we can move one layer above and we are going to see how the network performance affects the application. So when you have an application you're going to use UDP or TCP. I know that some people is going to use SCTP, but I, I really don't know any, anyone using it. So 
when you are using UDP, how is going to impact these metrics? What is, uh, how do I know what are the, the metrics that I need to have to measure the performance and to know how it's going to impact my application? So if I'm using a UDP, UDP is on a f um, fire and forget protocol. So you just need to, to pray that the packets arrive because nobody is going to guarantee that. So you know that for your application using UDP, UDP the performance is going to be heavily uh, affected for the packet loss. But what happens with TCP? And this, this is one of these uh, I heard in the previous talk and with this Provo between data centers, Provo and Nuremberg, and this is what happens in a lot of places that want to design data center active activities. They usually only check the, the bandwidth. And the bandwidth is important, but for networking, the, the most critical thing is the latency, because you cannot fight against the latency. With, and, and the latency impacts TCP directly, because the way that TCP works with the congestion window, if they are not able to act the packets on time, you start to, redu to, to reduce the throughput. Uh, you, you start either until you receive the, the, the act and you start to transmit again. So you can see in the graph how heavily affects uh, the routing latency to, to a TCP stream. The other big problem is with packet loss because if you have packet loss, you need to act again. So you are going back and forth. But one thing interesting of packet loss with TCP is that the way that the, the in networking you deal with TCP congestion. Because when you have a queue that is saturated, TCP is very aggressive. So it starts to try to, to try to get all the bandwidth. So what you do is you create a queue and you do the tail drop thing that is randomly you start to drop packets. So you start to affect the congestion of the client and they, he starts to reduce the, the TCP window. And how affects the network performance to the distributed system? So that's, that's one thing that's, that we realized in, in Midokura in, with Midonet. We had a distributed system and the problem is that the distributed system needs the network to communicate with the others. If the network doesn't work, it's not, the system is not going to work. And this is the main problem with, with this product like Kubernetes and OpenStack, that they are distributed systems. Um, I remember a, a, a situation with one developer that you know, we, we had a bug because we, we restarted one service, and then the application start, start, stopped to work. So he said, well, that's not my problem, it's a network problem. And of course it's your problem. Your application, when you are creating distributed systems, your application needs to know that the network is not reliable, that it's going to be latency. It has to recover. It has to be able to recover. And this, these fallacies were written in 1984. So that's, that's nothing new. And you can see in, in a lot of projects that are trying to create uh, distributed systems that they don't take into account the network. Uh, the network performance is going to affect everything, how the whole system behaves. So how do we measure the performance in this environment? So because when you are a network engineer, I, I, I went to the company and said, well, give me the, where I put the, the traffic generator. And they say, well, whatever you want. It's, it's impossible. You, you cannot apply the rules anymore. And if you have container, it's even worse. It's, it's how do you measure the, the performance in that environment? So we decided to take a different approach because when we were in the team, we were as QA, we went to the developers and we said, well, I think that this is not performing. And they started to ask, to tell us about the SKB allocation, the IR IRQ, we, we don't have that skills to understand that. We know that, I don't know, we have a server and we throw 10,000 requests and it started to misbehave. Then we decided to, 
to follow this, this definition. So we are not going to talk more about performance in terms of these metrics. We are not going to go to semantics. We are going to speak as, uh, with realistic scenarios. So we are going to say is what me, uh, my application has to do. So my application has to support 20,000 customers doing that to, uh, to servers, to web servers. So that's what we are going to do, and that's how we are going to test it. But what do you need for that? For that you need, for that you need a traffic generator that's, it, that is able to emulate all this traffic. You need to be able to emulate these these servers, to emulate these clients, and you are, you need to be able to generate it at, at line rate. When I mean line rate is with 10 gigas, you need to saturate with a smaller packet as possible because your goal is to burn, to burn the system down. And then we found this TRS tool. It's using the PDK, and when it started, it was a very simple mechanism. They, you just have a pickup, you have a template, and you say, I want this packet to go every 30 milliseconds with uh, 100 packets per second, and you have a scripting tool that is able to modify all the all the tuples of the IP IP packets. So you are able to to fake clients, servers, ports, whatever you want. The tool was evolving a lot. So the next request, when they started with the after this stateful stateful feature, they created the stateless feature. So for the people that is used to the Ixia traffic generator they will know that you can create the packet that you want and you can forward it at the speed that you want. And lately, with this new hype that now everything is load balanced, uh, uh, the application ledger, they are introducing a new functionality that is able to create advanced stateful functionality. That this means that it's able to, to understand applications. So you can fake, you can test a load balancer, you can fake the backend service, and this at 10 giga, 40 giga speed. So that's practically, it's, it's a dream for, for whatever uh, people that want to test network, because you are able to do whatever you want at the speed that, that you want. It also supports testing clusters and complex network scenarios. For example, that you have two load balancers and you want to say, well, I want to half of the traffic through this load balancer, the other half through the other lo load balancer. Or for example, you have a chain of uh, services. One service that is encrypting, the other that is uh, decry decrypting. So you can put the TREX in different places. It also supports to have multi-TREX, multi-traffic generator in different positions, so one can talk with the other. So thanks to Kubicek, I was able to, to access one, to have access to two servers that, we, that I set up to to try to do some demos. So basically, the more basic test bed possible is, is like this. You have two servers, you connect back-to-back uh, -back the servers, and one has the traffic generator, and you need to configure in your traffic generator the network that you want to fake, that you want to emulate. In the other server, you need to configure it, so it forward the traffic to the places that you want. In this case, with uh, Marfax, what Marfax is seeing is, is not seeing TRS, it's not seeing the other uh, service. It's seeing a lot of, a bunch of clients that is come, that are coming from the network 16.0.0.0 slash 16 and are going to the ETH1 interface that is crowded of servers with the 41000 slash 16. And this is the way that, that you are able to test. Marfac as a, as a device under test. I'm sorry. So I created a, a small demo so we can 
check let me see if it works check you can see this uh, Okay, so this is the test bed. So the zero window is my laptop. So, and I have the test bed with Marfac. Um, okay, I lose the connection. Well, let's see if it works. So I have I I have running the T-Rex in Albali, Albali and Marfac is the the big thing. So if I connect to the console in Albali, it fails. Of course, it fails. Uh, well, it's not working. I think that I have it recorded, so let me check. to record it, but it's not working, the recording thing. There is no connection. No, it's not connecting. Okay, I lost the connectivity. So let me try to. It's funny, so you are talking about networking and... Okay, I have the demo running here. Yeah, I know, it's disconnected. <laughs> you are not connected. So let me check if I can recover from this. Well, no luck. Mm. 
Well, let's have this for the same number. Okay, I have it in here. Record it. It doesn't work. Well, I, I'm not going to try to, I'm going to try to move forward because it's impossible. This is not working. Okay. The, the basically, what you do is you you the T-Rex creates a, a server that is listening, and you can connect with a with a Python API, whatever you need, whatever um, up whatever language that supports zero and Q and JSON, and and you can use the API to create it. So it's very simple to do different scenarios and it's very flexible. You just need to to imagine the thing that you want to do and, and just do it. Because it's Python and I was using to fight this. Uh, creating tests is very simple. So let me show, this is a, a I'm sorry, I'm not presenting. So it's very simple. So you just need to to attach the port. You can use this copy for some of you that are using this copy, and you can and you can create the packet that you want. It's just not uh, the flexibility of this copy is, is the key here, because if you are developing a new protocol, you can create. Uh, you can create easily with this copy the, the packet, and then you just need to use the API. In this case, we are using the STL stream, and we we configure it so we say you need to send 20 packets at the rate of uh, five packets per second. Then we attach the stream to the port and we start to forward. We wait during some time, and then we check that the traffic uh, that we sent we receive the same packet that we sent. You can do more checks. In the, in the in this case, I have I have it recorded, so you can see how how easy it's to automate this test this testing with T-Rex. You just need to have a T-Rex server somewhere in your network that is reachable from your testing machine, and and then you just have to hack with Python. What's next? So once you have this automated, you have the framework, you have everything, you need to create a continuous integration system that it basically with a simple pipeline, you just deploy the environment, means that the device under test or whatever you want to put under test that uh, has to be configured. You want to test a new kernel, you start the server with a new kernel, you reboot. Once it reboots, you connect to the t API, you start to 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 send the the traffic or to do the performance scenarios that you want. The good thing is that uh, everything, all the output is in JSON, so it's easy, easily stored in in Elasticsearch. You can store all these results in in Elasticsearch or whatever database that you want. And in the next step, you can check if you regress it because you are able to to have a a baseline. You are able to check with the previous results, and then if it, everything is okay, you should you can you can move to the next. You can merge or w in whatever position of the, your pipeline you want to use it. So, what lessons did we learn from in Midonet from performance testing? 
So the first thing is don't trust the benchmarks blindly because most of the time you see a benchmark but you don't really don't know what is benchmarking or what does it mean for you. So that's, that's, that's uh, the key. And that's the, dif the difference with this new approach is everybody understands what you're trying to test. You, the user, the customer understand what you're trying to test. The, devel the developer understand what you try to test. And the QA is the person between them and it's easy, it's easy for him to, to talk with everybody. The other thing is don't use virtual machines to test performance because it's a mock and with mocks you are you are not considering all the implications all the implications no? and you are forgotten about a lot of things the other thing that we found is useful is to add the testing code to the same repository that your application because this means that uh, the things that are developing the test, the things that are developing the features need to talk because if you are going to merge something and the test is failing, that patch is going to be queued until you fix that test. The other thing that is important is to test the performance periodically and don't allow regression. You need to set some threshold and you need to be committed to, to those thresholds because if you don't test periodically, at least nightly, after one week, you are not going to be able to go back to, to reduce this technical debt. Other thing is you need to performance, is, you need to live with, you need to know that the performance is always going to change. And usually it always changes for worse. So you need to be continually reviewing the thresholds and to understand well, this, we have we lose performance because of this feature, but you know, it's acceptable or not. And that's something that you need to do constantly. And the other thing is that the the with performance, the test needs to be reproducible. So don't make a <coughs> assumption that you say, well, this setup is the same that the other, because maybe you are using a different switch, a different cable or whatever thing, and mm, that's a lot of time that it's gonna take for you to, to resolve these problems. Well, I'm sorry I was expecting to do the, m the most beautiful thing was the demo and I wasn't able to do it. If you have any question or something, I think that's, that's it. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, okay. <laughs>